Uh, and final speaker this evening is uh, Richard Bronowski, a former diplomat, writer, and uh, of special interest, I think, for us tonight, when communication is so important in the work that we have to do, is that he was for three years a general manager of Radio Australia, which of course sadly no longer exists. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And I have to say, Margaret, that uh, Radio Australia does exist, but it exists up in the ether through G geostationary satellites. We used to measure the, the mail we got from, or the listenership we have in the Asia Pacific region by the weight of the mail bags that came in. And Indonesia was always very heavy. But nowadays, in, in the, the uh, meetings of the uh, cabinet in Fiji were interrupted to listen to Radio Australia news broadcasts. It was that significant, even more than the British Overseas Service. Unfortunately, that's gone, but I won't go into that now. Emma made a good point, I thought, about how Biden and Trump may be different personalities, but in fact, what is underneath is just the same, and that is US hegemony. And we have reached a position, ladies and gentlemen, where that is no longer viable. We have a great and powerful friend, I put that in brackets, I feel ironical about that. The Americans really won't help us if it's not in their interest to do so against a new emerging great power, and that's China. And what we have to do, and it's a desperate situation, as Hugh White has said, otherwise we'll be at war, which we can't win, is to compromise the situation to a point where we can get on with America because we have a huge heritage of, of, with the United States, of course we do. History, language, humor, a whole lot of sets of values that we have. But at the same time, China is a country, our greatest, power, our most uh, effective uh, trade partner and we have to get on with them. And we're not doing that. And the manufactured hostility we find in Canberra in the military industrial complex is risible and ludicrous. And I have to say, as a former diplomat of 34 years experience, as ambassador to Vietnam, to South Korea, to Mexico, to Cuba, I find Richard Miles an extraordinarily stupid man. <laughs> His father was headmaster of Trinity Grammar in Melbourne. He went to Geelong Grammar himself, a Sion of the Melbourne establishment. And what has he done? Why, I wonder, has he got this idea that we have to be not just lips and teeth with the United States militarily, but we have to be interchangeable? It's ridiculous and it's dangerous. Now, let me talk a bit about submarines. We're not going to get the astute British class because the Brits have taken all their nuclear technology from the United States. Westinghouse sold its reactor core technology, which is highly secret, to Rolls-Royce. The astute class is, is okay, but it's not as sophisticated or as grandiose as the, the Virginia class United States submarines, which are the ones we want to get. Now we can't even queue, we can't even crew the six Collins class submarines we have. We can maybe put two in the water at one time if the submarines themselves are okay, because we don't have the crews to run them. Let alone do we have the nuclear technology needed to efficiently and safely crew a nuclear submarine. That's only one problem. Another problem is that because we don't have the, 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 the people to, to crew them, if we were to buy, as Tony Abbott wanted to, to buy the Soryu class Japanese submarine in 1916, 1914, it's a very effective submarine. It's not nuclear powered, but it is very capable with air independent uh, um, fuel on board. It can, it can travel a long distance. They say that the submarine, the nuclear submarine is only limited by human capacity. 
And the Brits have worked out that the astute car submarine, the, it will go for as long as 10,000 sausages and four and a half thousand packets of wheat of it. Then they have to service and go to shore. The fact is though, that we don't have the technology to run the submarines, to build the submarines or to dock them because we have in Australia, a huge problem about where to put our radioactive waste ourselves. And we do have, we've had three reactors in the past, the Opal, the Open Plan, Australian reactor is the latest, that's from Argentina, that's up in Sydney in the inner suburbs or the outer suburbs of Sydney. Uh, before that, we had uh, an Australia, Australian reactor, HIFAR, the High Flux Australian reactor, which Bob Menzies launched in the 50s. And that was an experimental reactor, but we do not have the capacity to develop nuclear power, let alone nuclear weapons or nuclear propulsion systems. And I, I just think that uh, we've bitten off a great deal more than we could chew. And what will happen is that if we do get these submarines from the United States, we're more than ever dependent upon the United States. We lose whatever limited naval sovereignty we had over our, our new naval forces. They will be crewed by Australians who have trained and practiced in the United States, along with Americans, interchangeability, remember that word. And the sole purpose for these submarines, however you'd like to, 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 to uh, be disingenuous about it, is to help the United States contain China. China will not be contained. China will take back Taiwan. Legally, in international law, they have every right to do so. And it's wrong for us to talk about the invasion of Taiwan. That is not appropriate because it is, and we recognize it as such, a, a colonial, a, a part, a prefecture of China. And the Chinese are very determined not to let that happen. The Chinese are coming to terms with the fact that they were humiliated by the great white powers from the 19th century. They've now grown to the extent where they've got a much more powerful economy than the United States. And militarily, they are not yet up to the United States. Kim Beasley, I remember talking to Kim when he was president of the Australian Institute of International Affairs, and I was New South Wales president, and Kim had just come back from Washington as ambassador, and he earbashed me all the way about how the United States had tremendously powerful military forces. And if the balloon went up over Taiwan with China, the United States would which thrashed them to the end of their lives. Hugh White disagrees, I disagree, many other strategists dis disagree too. One of the problems the United States would have to overcome is distance. The United States to the eastern coast of Asia takes many, many sea days at sea, and they don't have the supply lines that continue to supply an effective force in the region. We are in, ineluctably tied in with the United States. Albanese has, has said it too. I'm disappointed very much in the Labor government. I thought they would have more sense. The only person of any sense in that government is Penny Wong. And she is trying very hard with the cooperation of Mr. Wang, the Chinese ambassador in Australia, to develop a discourse. And what you learn in Diplomacy 101 is that when you have a difficult relationship with another country, you begin with the soft options. You begin with things you can do. Oh, let's have the Peking Symphony Orchestra in, in Sydney. Let's send the MSO to, to Beijing. Let's talk about culture. Let's talk about film. Let's establish some dialogue some constructive dialogue. Then you move on to the hard stuff. Now we've just had some encouraging words, some encouraging news from, uh, from several uh, committees that have been held in Southeast Asia. The East Asia Summit in Phnom Penh, the G20 in Bali, and uh, the, the APEC meeting in Bangkok as well. At the G20, at least Albanese met Xi, was able to talk for half an hour. Biden had three and a half hours with him. Biden came out saying, yes, we looked at what we can do, how we can get together. 
But at the same time, we are actively participating, openly participating in developing armed forces to attack China. So we, ladies and gentlemen, we have a hell of a long way to go using all our diplomatic skills. And our diplomatic service has been diminished by both Liberal and Labor, particularly Liberal governments. Over the many years I've been a diplomat myself, we have to build up our diplomatic strength. And we have to stop thinking in terms of how we can build these submarines. Mind you, during the Second World War, Australia had no submarines at all, none in active service. After that, we, we built some submarines ourselves based on the ovens class British submarine before we went to the Collins. And then we got the French idea. But as I said earlier, the Soryu Japanese submarine would be the one I'd go for because it's cheap. And as Hugh White said tonight, we could buy 25 of the buggers for the cost of eight nuclear propelled submarines from the United States. So we could do it. Uh, just one thought for you. Pearl Harbor, the four, four of the six aircraft carriers that attacked Pearl Harbor came and attacked Darwin. If we'd had one local submarine or two lurking in the Torres Straits and the Japanese knew about it, they may not have attacked Darwin. So please don't dismiss the defensive capability of having local submarines for area defense, but not submarines that can go and be part of a, a force to attack and threaten China with nuclear oblivion. Thank you very much.